session four. This is an award winning session. Interesting uh, cases will be presented by different speaker. Here, eight speaker will present their case. Our first speaker, uh, Dr. Nabin Sheikh, dynamic presenter. She is working as an associate professor in the Department of Cardiology, BSMU. And this session will be chaired by our honorable chairperson, uh, Professor Sabina Hashim, Madam, Professor uh, Tuhinok, Madam, Professor uh, Dr. Muhammad Julfikar Ali, Lenin, sir, Dr. S. M. Alsan Abu, sir. Okay, and uh, honorable panelists are. Uh, Professor Dr. Shibli Haider, Dr. Shamir Kumar Kundu, Dr. Muhammad Jakir Hussain, Dr. Muhammad Jillu Rahman, Dr. Umme Salma Khan, Dr. Khandukar Muhammad Nurus Saba, Dr. Bijay Dottu, Dr. Shariar Kubir. We are requesting our honorable panelists to take the chair. I'm requesting our first presenter, Dr. Navin Sheikh, madam, to present her case, please. Today, my topic is aortic arch anomalies. So the objectives of this presentation is to understand the embryological basis of arch formation and to able to work out an embryological diagnosis or each arch anomaly. Why it is important as because it can compress the tracheal esophagus like vascular ring malformations and nodding compressions and hemodynamic issues like steel and lots of adult cardiologists they do radial interventions so they must have to know about the arch anomalies now uh, they can present with a strider swallowing difficulty choking of food diagnostic methods are chest x-ray echo ct and your mri cardiac cat and barium study so if we remember this diagram, it is very easy. Then we can work out any arch anomaly. There is anterior aorta, anteriorly and posteriorly, there is dorsal aorta. And in between two, there are six arches. Among the six arches on both sides, the first, second, and fifth pairs of aortic arches will disappear from these both sides. And only the third, fourth, and sixth will persist. Let's see. This is the third arch. From the third arch, common character data will arise. From the fourth arch and the left dorsal aorta, arch of the aorta will arise. From the sixth arch on the right side, right pulmonary artery will arise. And on the left side, left pulmonary artery and the duct will arise. And between the aorta, dorsal aorta, anterior aorta, there is also trunchiotic sac. It will fuse with the ventral aorta. And from the trunchiotic sac, the proximal part of the ascending aorta and the right back of the will arise. And here is the trachea and esophagus. And there is seven intersegmental artery the subclavian artery arise. It is very easy diagram. Then we'll get this uh, uh, final figure of the left aortic arch. The right dorsal artery will disappear on the right side. So what are the congenital elements of the aortic arch? The left side aortic arch and its variants, right side aortic arch and its variants, supernary arches, right uh, double aortic arch, interrupted aortic arch, anomalous origin of the pulmonary artery, coaptation of the and arch interaction. So, arch sedents and branching pattern. It is described on the right or left location of the aortic arch with respect to trachea and its course in relation to the bronchus. If the arch crosses the left bronchus, it is called the left arch. If it crosses the right bronchus, it's called the right arch. Here we can see the superstitial view. The first division in case of left aortic arch, this first division that is the innominate, it will go to the right side and divides into right subclavian and right concavity artery. So the supraesternal echo, here we can see the branching pentas of the left aortic arch. The first two, from right to left, the brachycephalic artery, then it branches into right subclavian and right common carotid artery, then the common left common carotid and the subclavian. This is the supraesternal, how to take the view. Okay, the normal variation in the left aortic arch and branching pentas are bovine arch, left aortic arch with abundance of right subclavian artery, uh, abundance right subclavian artery, the diverticular of comoral and others. So what is vascular ring? This abnormal structure that uh, encircles the trachea and esophagus. This is example of left aortic arch with abnormal receptor artery. It can cause dysphagia in adult. It is known as dysphagia illusoria from the suprastinal view. In the first division, if it doesn't bifurcate, we have to look for abnormal receptor artery. So this is the uh, left arch with abnormal receptor artery. You can see the CT image. It is due to persistence of the seven intersegmental artery. 
then right aortic artery. Right aortic artery results when the development of pattern of the four branchial arches rivers, it is associated with D dot symbol, conotrunkal, top, etc. Here we can see the first division is going towards the, in case of right aortic artery, first division will go towards the left side and then it will divide into, into two. This is the suprastal view of the right aortic arch. So the XHS showing the normal aortic knob uh, on the left side is absent and is present on the right side. And CT and Geo of a 15 years old male showing that the right aortic arch, it is crossing the right bonkers. Here we can see the CT image of the right arch. Aortic arch angiogram at RA cranial view, we can see this, there is right aortic arch. Normal variation in the right aortic arch and mirror image branching, aberrant left subclavian level and isolated subclavian among these three Type two is very uh, only important. Right aortic arch with aberrant life cycle artery, it is the common cause of vascular ring and it causes uh, respiratory symptoms or dysphagia in adults. In case of suprasternal view, if the first arch branch divides, then it is the innovator. If it doesn't divide, it is the aberrant cycle. And here CT image showing the aberrant life cycle. Same, then mirror image. Then double arch. What is double arch? It results from the lack of involution of both right and left arch. And it surrounds the trachea and esophagus. And suprasternal long axis view of a two years old baby with respiratory distress showing the right and left aortic arch. It's not playing. I don't know why. Okay. The same patient with the CT and you showing the double aortic arch here, right, left, right, left. Same patient, then double aortic arch in a 23 years old male with dysphagia. Chase detector showing this inattention on the both side of the trachea by the double arch. And also suprasternal short axis view showing two circles of both arches on the both sides of the trachea. Now same patient ascending aortogram showing the right and left aortic arch. Same patient 3D reconstruction of the aortic arch showing the double aortic arch. Right, left, here, right, left. Now, what is interrupted arch? It is uh, defined as complete interruption of aortic lumen between the ascending and descending aorta. There are three types, type A, B, C. Its types are divided into three subtypes. This is the type A. Here we can see uh, the interruption is beyond the uh, left supplement artery. This is the CT angiogram of a type A in a 15 years old male. We can see there's interruption just distal to the left supplement artery. Same. Then type B, between the interruption between the left common artery and the left subclavian. Suprasternal echo showing that the left subclavian artery is arising distal to the interruption from the descending aorta. This is the type C. Here we can see there is no blood flow between the aortic arch and the descending aorta. This is the type B, B in art interruption, ascending aortic ground showing. Why it is not playing? Ascending aortic ground showing that left common artery and brachiocephalic tank arising from the arch, but we cannot see the subclavian. I don't know, uh, the video is not playing. Okay, then coarctation of the order, 20 uh, years old girl with Turner syndrome with uncontrolled hypertension, suprasternal view showing severe quad, CT image showing severe quad beyond the left subclavian artery. Then arch hyperplasia here in an eight months old baby with hypoplastic LB and bipoplastic aortic ball. Here, distal aortic arch is hypoplastic, that is 50%, it is less than 50% of the ascending aorta. Then anomalous LPA from the RPA. It is known also uh, PS link. Then cervical arch, it is due to displacement of the arch from its typical medicinal position to a level above the clavicle. It can cause dysphagia and respiratory distress. Another finding is supraclavical positive mass and X-ray, there will be enlarged mediastinum. And persistent feet arch is also known as the double barrel, barrel arch or systemic system connection. Here it connects the ascending and descending aorta and it can be seen by echo, suprasternal echo between the true arch and the pulmonary artery. Then circumference has a very uncommon variant of the right arch due to disappearance of the right fourth arch, but the left is still aorta. Now, in case of left aortic arch, if there is normal branching, patient will be asymptomatic. If there is isolation of the right supplement artery, there will be still phenomenon. In case of right aortic arch, if there is a mirror image, patient will be symptomatic with us if there is associated with other congenital heart disease. If in case, uh, if there is aberrant left supplement artery, there will be uh, rarely tracheal compression. And if there is isolation of the left supplement artery, there will be still phenomenon. In case of double aortic arch, there will be tracheal compression. So in conclusion, aortic arch and also developmental abnormality that are present in the fetus, and a small number of patients do not manifest symptoms until later in life and others remain entirely asymptomatic. And intervention required only in symptomatic care when associated with other cardiac anomalies. So to plan effective management of congenital heart disease, all patients, child or adult must be looked thoroughly for every cardiac animals carefully by suprasternal echo to avoid misses. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, your time is up. And thank you for your brilliant presentation.
Now I would like to request Dr. Shakhat Alam. He is uh, working as an assistant professor in uh, pedicardiology in Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. May I start, Madam? Uh, respected chairpersons and uh, learned audience. Um, I am Dr. Shakhat Alam, assistant professor of pediatric cardiology in BSMO, going to present my case. <laughs> Uh, transthoracic uh, echocardiography, evaluation of evaluation in case selection for transcatheter VHD closer and its significance during the procedure. VHD is the most common cause of congenital heart disease in our center as well as in this subcontinent. And uh, there are four types of BHD according to anatomical location, perimembranous BHD, inlet BHD, outlet BHD, and muscular BHD. Out of these things, uh, out of this muscular BHD, and there are three types of muscular BHD. One is anterior, mid muscular, and posterior muscular BHD. Out of these four types of BHD, only perimembranous and the muscular BHD are suitable for device closure. What you see for with the device closure uh, uh, with the echocardiography? We see the anatomy of the BHD, like morphology morphological location and size and number of the defect and presence of valvular overriding or septal malalignment. Number two, assessment of the chamber size, identification of the uh, associated location and assessment of suitability for percutaneous device closure and to decide about the selection of the device. What you see with the Doppler echocardiography, with the color Doppler, location of the BHD, especially smaller BHD and multiple muscular BHD, size of the BHD, and the determination of the shunt direction across the ventricular septum. With the spectral Doppler, what we see is interventricular septal gradient uh, with the help of the color, color flow mapping. And all small turbulent flow should be confirmed by the pulse wave and uh, continuous wave to prevent the false interpretation of the color flows and Shan calculation. So now my case, Mr. Rex, 18 years young boy, hailing from uh, Shorup Kati, Borishal, third issue of a non consequence parent with a poor socioeconomic background, came to our hospital with the complaints of repeated history of respiratory tract infection and occasional breathing difficulties. He was first diagnosed to have congenital heart disease at one month of age with the registered physician locally during the routine clinical follow-up and referred to Dhaka for further evaluation. But with the financial constraint, he was not able to come to Dhaka for more evaluation. At six years of age, he was first evaluated by ECO and diagnosed to have congenital heart disease, BSD, uh, and advice for surgical repair, but failed with the same financial problem and left with moral medical uh, management. And next, at six years of, 16 years of age, he was re-evaluated by ECO and advised for transcatheter device closure. And it was late because of COVID pandemicity. On examination, he was thin built, anxious looking. He was 5.5 uh, five feet, five inch, but weight only, 55 kilo. His vitals are 100 beat, uh, heart rate was 100 beat per minute, BP was 130 over 80 millimeter of mercury. Chest findings were normal. Uh, his, um, uh, his visible apex beat was on the fifth intercostal space at the mid clavicular line with a systolic thrill, but no heave. And the first and second heart sound was audible, but second heart sound was merged with the pan systolic murmur at the left lower external border and other, no other uh, murmur was there. On ECG, his heartbeat is about 110 and on uh, there is no normal PR interval and there is LV strain is there. And mild LV uh, left axis uh, deviation was there and extra swing, situs solitas, um, <clears throat> levocardia, and uh, there is no much cardiomegaly, and there is no uh, pulmonary hypertension like pleuritic yeah, lung field. On echo, we have assessed the echo. Mm. 
there is a left to right shunt and it was measured about uh, 2.97 millimeter 3.97 millimeter and uh, there is a uh, left to right shunt with a uh, uh, high interventricular gradient meaning there is normal pulmonary pressure and the ear to power point like this is kunta sir डिस क्लोजर and this is a isolated bsd with normal pulmonary pressure and the uh, bsd is uh, bsd uh, location is away from the valve uh, by uh, aortic valve so we have uh, selected this case for uh, device closure and the device according to the morphology of the bsd uh, we select um, uh, adio2 uh, um, Based, adhere to for based occlusion, and uh, we have done an NGO in a LA cranial view. I can take it. I can take it. Cranial uh, 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 NGO showing uh, small uh, video, uh, small uh, BSD, and it is away from the significantly away from the valve, aortic valve. And it is significantly away from the uh, aortic valve. and um, we cross the bsd with the uh, uh, termo wire and we have uh, placed the termo anchor in the uh, pulmonary artery in an integrate uh, approach and we have uh, yeah we have this, uh, we have uh, uh, assess the uh, bsd device with the echo and it is showing that uh, both side the uh, rv disc and la disc are open and um, here it is showing that both the la disc and lv disc is there in the right position sir your time is up yeah just one minute and uh, uh, No, no, no. It's a porter then, porter. Yeah, and uh, uh, according to we assess the um, uh, uh, BSD uh, the device after just after uh, before just before the dislodgement uh, yeah deployment and it is showing there is no uh, aortic regurgitation and uh, we have deployed this uh, device successfully with six by six ADO two BSD device. and on conclusion uh, transthoracic echo is very crucial in vhd selection and device selection for the transcatheter device closure as well as during the device deployment and follow up thank you very much thank you sir for your excellent presentation and the next case will be presented by dr mohammad roshan masood who is working as a consultant and head of the non interventional cardiology asgor ali hospital i am requesting dr Mohammad Rafshan Masood sir to present his case. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Mohammad Rafshan Masood. Would like to present my case. A history of forgotten valve, or headline may be a history of neglected valve. Forty years old gentleman with known case of chronic rheumatic heart disease with severe mitral stenosis. He underwent mitral valve replacement at the age of thirty-seven years. Gradually, he feels previous. Symptom more in last six months: shortness of breath, NOH grade four, 
abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, ascites, peripheral edema. Two months back, two months ago, he developed severe shortness of breath and admitted into hospital. Ultimately, he put on mechanical ventilation, but unfortunately, after a couple of days, patient died. What will be happened? Do you have any idea? Is it due to acute valve thrombosis? Visitation or infective endocarditis? Bulb dehiscence or penis formation? That is mechanical valve failure or other pathology? Let's do some investigation. X-ray chest showing cardiomegaly, ECG showing atrial fibrillation. Echocardiography demonstrated well-functioning prosthetic metal valve, but tricuspid valve reveals severe tricuspid stenosis, which was missed in echo and surgeon only replaced metal valve. What should be the next step of management? Let's know about prosthetic heart valve. Prosthetic heart valves are two types, uh, mechanical and by prosthesis. Mechanical like ball and case, which was introduced in 1952 and first implanted by uh, Dr. Charles Hafnagel. Tilting disc was introduced in 59. Bilbilpid valve is introduced in 69. Biprosthetic valve is stentless, stented and paracutinous, that is TAVI. This is mechanical valve. Uh, this is structure of bilipid valve, ball and case valve. Uh, this is metal position, housing, ring, ball and case. Tilting disc in uh, aortic uh, mitral valve position, tilting disc in aortic valve position, bilipid uh, valve. Uh, this is disc, this is follow pattern or hemodynamics. This is biological tissue valve. Extended stent plate and paracutinous, that is TAVI. How to assess prosthetic valve function? By clinical evaluation, symptom sign, date of valve surgery, types and size of valve. By 2D echocardiography, we can assess type of valve, disc, ball mobility, swing ring movement, bright area and penis formation, any mobile masses. By color Doppler, continuous Doppler and tissue, and pulse wave Doppler, we can assess color flow pattern, excessive turbulence in flow, that is stenotic, valvular regurgitation, either it is washing jet or abnormal jet. Paravalvular leakage means flow outside swing ring, valvular leakage means flow within the ring. The same way we can assess a biological valve. What and how to quantitate? Assessment of prosthetic metal valve, peak velocity normal less than one, suggestive of significant if it is more than 2.5, mean gradient less than five normal, more than 10 significant. Prosthetic mitral valve VTI divided by LVT VTI if it is less than 2.2 is normal, more than 2.5 is significant. Effective orifice area more than two is normal, less than one is significant. Pressure half time, we know that less than 130 is normal and more than 200 is significant stenosis. Uh, this is my patient. His peak gradient was uh, average 1.9, mean gradient average 6. If we see pressure half time, pressure half time is uh, less than 130 is normal, but my patient, look, pressure half time is only 50. Mital VTI divided by prosthetic valve VTI, if you see, uh, Prosthetic valve VTI was 52 and uh, LVT VTI 27. So VTI index is only two. If it is no, less than 2.2 is normal. If it is more than 2.5 is significant stenosis. We can assess effective orifice area by continuity equation by cross-sectional area of LVOT into LVOT VTI divided by VTI prosthetic metal valve. So all the parameters demonstrate that uh, well functioning uh, prosthetic mitral valve. What's about tricuspid valve? Tricuspid stenosis causes a primary rheumatic congenital carcinoid antiphospholipid divestant anomaly, secondary thrombo thrombus, endocarditis, intracardiac masses. This is the pathophysiology of tricuspid valve. Tricuspid stenosis is less common in rheumatic heart disease following mitral and aortic 
stenosis. Doming of leaflet is hallmark of tricuspid stenosis. Candle flame sign is another diagnostic feature. Looks, this is look like uh, candle flame sign. Severe calcification, hemodynamics. We know the hemodynamics. How to quantify uh, prosthetic tricuspid stenosis? If peak velocity more than 1.7, mean gradient more than 6, pressure half time 230. We can assess a tricuspid valve area by pressure half time 190 divided by uh, pressure half time. This is my patient. Pressure uh, peak velocity was 2, mean gradient was nine, this is significant pressure half time average 240. So all the parameters indicate that there is severe tricuspid stenosis. Severe tricuspid regurgitation, this is look like candle flame sign, severe tricuspid regurgitation. Inferior vena cava is dilated, non-collapsible, and collapsibility index less than 20. So final calculation, look sign symptom, structural findings, previous eco findings, hemodynamic findings. Take home masses, do eco carefully, don't rush, access all valve, provide all information, often eco is life-saving tools. If you miss, patient will be missed. Thank you for patient sharing. Thank you, Dr. Roshan Masud, sir, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, dear participant, you may ask question if you have any questions to the speaker. Do you have any questions? Anyone wa want to ask question? If you don't have any question, then I can move into next case presentation that would be presented by Dr. Shahana Zaman, Assistant Professor from uh, National, National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. Honorable chairpersons, respected panelists, learned audience, assalamu alaikum. My today's topic is Ortner syndrome due to cardiac myxoma, an uncommon presentation of a common problem. A 36 year old lady sought medical consultation for eight week history of effort intolerance and exertional dyspnea 11 months ago. She had been treated as bronchial asthma by local physicians. Her physical condition was not improved, rather she developed dizziness on exertion. She consulted a cardiologist locally and was referred to NICBD for further management. She was admitted at coronary care unit of NICBD. She was hemodynamically stable at CCU of NICBD with a regular pulse of 96 per minute. Blood pressure was 90 by 60 millimeter mercury. First heart sound was normal and second heart sound was loud. And there was a mid diastolic murmur in mitral area which had a changing intensity with change of posture. This was her ECC, which showed right axis deviation. Then we have done echocardiography, and echocardiography revealed we found a mass which is uh, occupying the uh, left atrium, that is homogeneous, uh, inhomogeneous mass, which is prolapsing towards the which is prolapsing towards the left ventricle during diastole. This is the M mode through the mass where it showed L is slightly uh, dilated, which is about 45 millimeter. LV function and LV dim dimensions this seems to be normal. This is the apical four chamber view showing there is a, a mass which is at rest with this peduncle with the intraatrial septum and prolapsing towards the left ventricle during diastole. This is two chamber view showing that mass and which is attached with a peduncle into the, with the intraatrial septum. This is the apical three chamber view. And uh, obstruction, uh, uh, mitral valve obstruction is about uh, 30 millimeter peak and, uh, and the mean was 23 uh, three millimeter mercury. And patient also have severe pulmonary hypertension, which is about 92 plus right atrial pressure. Her RV function was normal and inferior vena cover was not dilated and less than 
collapsibility. We urgently uh, seek surgical consultation for possible excision myxoma, but operation could not be done because of outbreak at COVID-19. And that time, our operation theater were closed. In the meantime, patient developed intractable cough and hoarseness of voice. We detailed survey the respiratory and neurological system, but we revealed normal findings. A series of investigations were done, but most of the test report appeared unyielding, including CT chest, but laryngoscope showed there is a left vocal cord paralysis. At the time, surgeon had COVID-19, so operation was deferred repeatedly. In that time, uh, one question was our, our mind, that is, is it was ordinary syndrome caused by severe pulmonary hypertension or dilated left atrium? At last operation was done. At eight centimeter pedunculated tumor arose from the fossa ovalis in the left atrium. Surgeon removes the tumor and repaired the small resulting defect in the atrial septum. The gross and microscopic pathology of the tumor confirmed an atrial myxoma. Atrial dysrhythmias complicated the patient's post-operative course, however, resolved prior to discharge. Subsequent follow-up after three months revealed she had considerable improvement regarding her voice and cardiac symptoms. Her voice is almost completely restored. Follow-up laryngoscopic examination showed improved abduction of the left vocal cord during phonation, suggesting resolution of the recurrent laryngeal lung palsy. Ortner syndrome was first described by Robert Ortner, an Austrian physician in 1897 in three cases of mitral stenosis with dilated left atrium. Subsequently, different cardiovascular causes like mixed mitral valve disease, pulmonary hypertension, cord pulmonary, aortic aneurysm, isomenza syndrome were added to the etiology, hence the term changed to cardiovocal syndrome. Just after one, uh, uh, one century after the first demonstration of uh, Ortner syndrome. In 1989, Fraser Rubens reported the first case of Ortner syndrome due to LA myxoma. Pulmonary hypertension or some cause leading to dilatation and increased tension of the pulmonary artery may be responsible for vocal cord palsy. Vocal cord paralysis occurs due to compression, stretching, and pulling of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. It would therefore be pertinent to look beyond the learnings for a cause of vocal cord palsy in patient presenting with hoarseness of voice. Treatment is directed towards the correction of underlying etiology, and prognosis depends on the underlying etiology as well as the duration of the illness. I uh, I'm showing my uh, uh, heartfelt gratitude to uh, my teacher, Dr. A. K. Monor Islam, who is working as an associate professor of cardiology and I say for this case. Thank you, thank you all for giving me attention. Thank you, Madam, for excellent presentation. Is there any question from the audience to the presentation? Presenter. Sir, a uh, patient actually should get diagnosis by exclusion. Due to the Amra or host of also voice, only one cause pine, respiratory cause pine, sir. I'm a neurological cause pine. I'm patient a key at Domoti. I'm a laryngoscopy, the definite vocal cord paralysis power gate. I'm sheta after operation patient which is subsided with a patient improved for it. Shake it, I'm a my it is the diagnosis of exclusion, sir. Recover total recoverment to it, sir. No, sir, a single entity. Now, myxoma mainly pulmonary, severe pulmonary hypertension is the number of hop to see. Count a LAJ diameter, a LA diameter, auto borona jet to compress put the pare, a can severe pulmonary hypertension, hyper pressure, uh, pressure over the uh, left laryngeal nerve may be culprit for this lesion. Here we think so or thought so. Pressure of why, sir, pulmonary artery pressure. Pulmonary is severe pulmonary hypertension, um, uh, real, nearly 102 millimeter mercury for this patient. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, there's a uh, literature survey showed uh, a few patients who presented uh, uh, Ortner syndrome due to dilated pulmonary artery due to uh, pulmonary hypertension. Maybe, sir. Maybe, sir. Not, uh, sir. <laughs> Most likely, sir. Thank you, madam, for your excellent presentation. Our next case will be presented by Dr. Naharuma Alvi Haider Choudhury, who is working as assistant professor in 
National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. I would like to request Dr. Naharuma Alvi Haida Chaudhary, ma'am, to present her case. On announcement, we had a sunset session. In this session, okay. our foreign okay. delegates will present Record. interesting Thank cases. You. So uh, I would like to request all the participants to stay and to hear for the next sessions. Assalamu alaikum. Uh... I am Dr. Naharuma I.V. Haider Choudhury, Assistant Professor, PGT Cardiology Department of National Heart Foundation. It's an honor and uh, privilege for me to present in front of this August gathering in person and in virtual. The topic of my presentation is coronary sinus type of ASD, an unusual variant of interactual communication. Uh, I am going to three consecutive cases. My first case, 27-year-old female who was symptomatic and physically reveals normal finding. And ECG was normal axis uh, with incomplete RBV. Before exploration of the echo of my patient, just I want to share the anatomy of the coronary sinus because it is very important. The coronary sinus, which is uh, located in the coronary sulcus in the posterior atrioventricular group, its roof forms the floor of the left atrium and it opens into the right atrium beside the uh, sepal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and medial to the inferior vena cava. In sagittal plane, it looks like a uh, circular structure. So in uh, plex view, it is a patient where the, uh, it was a normal finding to circular structure. This is a small uh, structure, circular, which is coronary sinus, and this is for descending thoracic aorta, and this is my case, where the coronary sinus is hugely dilated. And uh, this is the modified four chamber view where it uh, seems the coronary sinus, the roof forming the floor of the left atrium, which open to the right atrium near the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And this is my case. If uh, we see that there is a small ASD secundum, which is causing the significant right-sided chamber dilatation. So I am in dilemma. Is this the small ASD causing this significant chamber dilatation? So I was searching and I was trying to find any missing septal defect or unusual communication at the atrial level. And I am fortunate that I got my answer. There is a communication between the coronary sinus and the left atrium. And there is a, uh, another finding that left-sided upper pulmonary vein, which is draining into the coronary sinus, rather the left atrium. And there is a shunt between the left atrium and the coronary sinus with left to right shunt. And there is the uh, 2D gap in the coronary sinus in the proximal portion. And this is the transesophageal echo where it showed that the small ASD is second term with left to right shunt. So we do the CT angiogram of this patient and we find there is a communication which confirmed by the CT, left atrium and coronary sinus and left-sided pulmonary vein which drain to the coronary sinus. And this is the three, three reconstructed uh, CT angiogram where we've suggested the same finding with the communication between the coronary sinus and left atrium. So we took the patient to the OR and uh, we, uh, the surgeon also confirmed this is the coronary sinus if we compare with the pictorial and this is the in I IVC and this is the SVC and this the vent is passing through the PFO to the left atrium. So surgeon has directly closed the ASD and rerouted of the left pulmonary vein into the left atrium by diverting coronary sinus route to the left atrium. So this is the post-operative echo where there is no residual shunt and this patient was in follow-up and maintaining well. My second case is three or seven month asymptomatic child who was uh, diagnosed during routine evaluation of the respiratory tract infection, having right atrial enlargement with mild increased pulmonary blood flow. And this is the patient also very much suspicious having only PFO with left to right shunt, but the right atrium is significantly enlarged. So there also I'm finding something missing and we got that here coronary sinus is dilated and if we see the coronary sinus, the proximal portion is unroofed. And this is the left to right shunt between the coronary sinus and left atrium. So in this case also we operated and this is the coronary sinus where surgeon has put and closed this ASD with patch closer and that PFO is directly closed. And this is my third and last case, seven year symptomatic patient having ejection systolic murmur. And here also we uh, got the coronary sinus is dilated and there is unroofing of the proximal portion. 
and he usually dilated right sided chamber. And we found here also that uh, with left to right shunt and anomalous left sided upper pulmonary venous trainers. And we do the 3D echo here. And in 3D also, it confirmed that there is a proximal unroofing of the coronary sinus with left atrium. This patient also had the prolapse of mitral valve with significant AMR, mild AMR. And this patient has large ASD secondum, additional large ASD secondum. So coronary sinus type of ASD is the unroofing partial or complete defect between the coronary sinus and the left atrium. And it is very rare, less than 1% of all uh, ASD and associated with persistent LSBC, anomalous pulmonary venous return, cortriton, tetralogy of fallout, and atrioventricular septal defect. So why diagnosis is important? To prevent pulmonary hypertension, brain abscess, and cerebral emboli. So take home message is coronary sinus ASD is extremely rare congenital heart disease. It is less than 0.1%. And transthoracic and transesophageal echo is considered a very useful tool to detect a coronary sinus type of ASD. We must be suspicious. A small defect cannot produce so much of hemodynamics. And one congenital anomaly can be associated with other congenital defects. So we have to be very curious and cautious. And cardiac CT and MRI have become indispensable imaging tool and surgical treatment is mandatory to prevent the complication. So thank you all for being with me. Both of you are all lucky. Thank yes, you sir. very much. Thank you. Very so much. the message is uh, we have to be very cautious because if we don't look for that uh, coronary sinus that is dilated, we, we also miss that. And also lucky that he was covered by the shooting or trying hope for you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Now, uh, next case will be presented by Dr. Nilifar Fatima Choudhury, consultant cardiologist from Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Assalamu alaikum, uh, learned audience. I am Dr. Nilifar Fatima, consultant department of cardiology, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. I'm going to present my case, uh, a pulse pulseless uh, young patient. He is a uh, 34 years male, uh, headache for four years, dizziness and vertigo and pleuritic chest pain. And uh, this pain radiates both hands. And on pulse examination, uh, brachial, both brachial and radial pulses are absent and bilateral popliteal and artery dorsal is present, um, uh, predis are present. And ankle blood pressure was measured and it is 160 by 95 millimeter of mercury. And there is bilateral carotid brui. In inve uh, investigation, the uh, e um, ESR and CRP both are raised and uh, ECG shows LVH and ECO shows no regional wall motion abnormality, mind LV concentric hypertrophy, good LV systolic function, ejection fraction 65. And uh, tissue Doppler imaging shows grade one diastolic dysfunction of LV and mild pericardial effusion. This is uh, his ECG, LVH present, and um, 2D echo shows a dilated LA, and LVH and um, good LV systolic function with mild pericardial effusion. TDI showed diastolic dysfunction. Next, uh, we did the carotid duplex study. And uh, here you, you can uh, see in the left panel, uh, it is a um, atherosclerotic change in uh, carotid, carotid uh, Doppler, uh, where you should see the intima medial thickness is slightly increased and it is eccentric uh, in anterior wall thickening. In the uh, figure B shows the my case, uh, which is the increased intermedial thickness in whole length. And this is called the macaroni sign. And you can appreciate here in colored flow of in a right coronary, um, common, right coronary, uh, right common carotid artery. And it, uh, you can see the macaroni sign that whole thickness of um, yeah, intima middle thickness is increased in whole length of this common carotid artery. 
And you can appreciate here in figure A, uh, this is an eccentric interval um, um, the plug in uh, atherosclerotic uh, old pa uh, patient. And in my case, figure B, you can appreciate the, there is no plug, but the, the whole intermedial thickness is uh, thickened. So what is macaroni sign? It is a typical occurs in Takashi arteritis. It represents the smooth, homogeneous, moderately ecogenic circumferential thickening of our arterial wall. And it is the pathognomic ultrasonographic sign in this disease. Here is the reference. And uh, when we uh, did duplex and uh, there is peak systolic and end diastolic, both velocities are increased. Next, we did the CT atography and its branches to confirm the case. And you can appreciate here, there is a uh, loss, um, uh, absent uh, left subclavian artery and uh, right subclavian artery is uh, there, but uh, when it became axillary artery, it became absent. And there is a significant narrowing in both common carotid artery. And you can also appreciate here the bilateral renal and common iliac artery stenosis, which is segmental. So segmental steno narrowing can be happen also in uh, Takashi arteritis. Takashi arteritis, it is a granulomatous vasculitis affecting the aorta and its branches and onset is before 50 years of age and chronic vascular inflammation leads to adventitial thickening and intima medial thickness, uh, medial hyperplasia due to the cellular infiltration and chronic and persistent inflammation leads to the fibrosis of the medium and intima and resulting the narrowing of this artery. These are the reference and other mortality, we can do the conventional autography MR autography and PET scan. It can measure the intensity of the inflammation in vessel. Future for this group of patients is immune study and genetic study. And treatment options are uh, corticosteroid to control the inflammation, immune suppressive drug, methotrexate and azathioprine can be used and biologics um, also con can be considered with um, research are going on. And there is um, percutaneous angioplasty we can do and also surgical option that is bypass surgery. <clears throat> so the take home message is carotid ultrasonography is the best non-invasive modality of the uh, vessel wall assessment in case of Takashi arteritis. And um, angiography is com confirmatory test in this disease and it can show the luminal narrowing and extent of the involvement. And macaroni sign is the pathognomic ultrasonographic sign in Takashu arteritis. So when we get macaroni sign, then we can um, um, we will get the clue that it can we are dealing with a Takashu arteritis disease. And duplex study can also be done to see the treatment response. Thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Nilupar Fatima Choudhury. Uh, is there any question from the audience to the presenter? Okay, then we'll proceed to the next case. The next case will be presented by Dr. Choyon Kumar Sinha, cardiologist working in Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. I would like to request Dr. Choyon Kumar Sinha to present his case. Honorable Chairperson, respected panelists and learning audience, very good afternoon to all and welcome to everybody on today's presentation. Everybody, we know that we are passing the last day of this year and we hope that uh, the upcoming days will be very happy for everybody. And today I would like to present my case and the title is All Soil That Hands Oil. My patient, a 35 years old adult who was non-diabetic, non-motensive, non-asthmatic, non-smoker, he presented to us with the complaints of progressively increasing shortness of breath Cup with occasional hemoptysis, generalized swelling, which started from his lower limb, and fatigability, exertional palpitation, and occasional dizziness for the last two years. On examination, he had low blood pressure, tachypnea, hypoxemia, uh, raised jugular venous pressure, she, uh, he was cyanosed, edematous ecteric. Cardiovascular system examination reveals he had lip personal lip, palpable P2, P2 was loud. And abdominal examination reveals mildly endless tender liver with ascites as evidenced by positive shifting dullness. 
This is the ECG which showed the complete right ventral branch block with RBS with STN and triatex deviation. Other investigation reveals uh, cardiomegaly in the X-ray, altered liver function, and ultrasonogram reveals congestive hepatomegaly with moderate ascites. Next, we done echo. This is the left personal long axis view showing the huge dilatation of the RV, interventricular septum bulge, and there is evidence of pericardial effusion. This is the uh, normal LA ratio, and the uh, here shows the paradoxic septal motion with normal left ventricular function. Here shows the mild pericardial effusion, and this is the colorful mapping revealed uh, mild uh, tibial tear. Here show the uh, D shaped LB indicate the RB pressure overload, and the pulmonary artery is dilated 32 millimeter. Here shows the mild pulmonary regurgitation and the PRZ velocity 2.3. This is the apical four chamber view. Here shows the grossly dilated RA and RB and interventricular septum and intertest septum bulge toward the left indicate huge uh, dilatation of the RA and RB. This is the colorful mapping showing there is mild to moderate tachyspid regurgitation. This is a spectral display of continuous wave Doppler across the tachyspid bulb showing the TRZ velocity 4 and peak pressure gradient 67. Here, taps, the tachyspid annular pen systolic excursion was 9, in, indicate our impaired RB systolic function. IVC was usually dilated and there was loss of respiratory variation. So echocardiographic impression was this is a case of severe pulmonary hypertension with moderate RB systolic function and mild pericardial effusion. To serve the etiology of this pulmonary hypertension, we done undergone several investigation. TE show uh, detect no shunt anomaly. Duplex study of the lower limb showed the conic venous insufficiency of the right lower limb. Uh, CT pulmonary angiography was done, showed the organized thrombus in the proximal segment of the right pulmonary artery and in the lower segment of the left pulmonary artery. Other thrombophilic screening was done, showed no evidence of thrombophilia. This is the CTPA show organized thrombus. Catheterization done, both right and left, showed the marked raised PVR and coronary were normal. So our diagnosis is a case of chronic thrombomolic CBL pulmonary hypertension with right heart failure. So our next plan was to do pulmonary thromboendractor team, but it was challenging since the development of this operation in 1970. There is a very few smart surgeons in the world, but ultimately we uh, uh, undergo operation uh, through the uh, average surgeon. And after the operation, he is doing uh, good and he underwent physiotherapy and anticoagulation. And he was regular follow-up. He showed a marked improvement of his clinical fissure and echocardiographic fissure. But due to extraordinary development of his improvement of his symptom, he was lost to follow-up and reluctant to take his medication regularly. And seven months later, he consulted to us with the fissures of respiratory infection with mild dyspnea. At this time, he was diagnosed with severe COVID-19 and echo was done, showed the large thrombus in the LV, and uh, the echo was done, showed the uh, moderate, dil moderate uh, LV systolic dysfunction and dilatation of the LV, and so diagnosed as a case of severe COVID-19 with LV myocarditis, LV thromba thrombus, and moderate LV systolic dysfunction. He was extensively managed in the ICU with accordingly, uh, and he was discharged 20 days later, but 20 days later, he again presented to us with cough and hemoptysis. We thoroughly evaluated and CT scan revealed bilateral thick wall cavitating lesion in the left and right. CT guided definition was done from that lesion, and the histopathology report revealed mucormycosis. That means black fungus. And he was treated by accordingly with liposomal amputation B and oral posaconazole for consecutive three months. And two days ago, he came uh, to us for last follow up. He is doing good, and his echo was done. Here shows the normal LB uh, motion, LBAF was 55, LBIDD was 45, here shows the good motion and uh, no PR, RRB was absolutely normal, no tachyspeed regurgitation was seen, this spectral reveals in the normal TRZ and take home message is uh, this, life is not a bed of roses, it's always challenging, a huge ups and downs may happen, though chronic thrombolytic pulmonary hypertension is a potentially curative disease, but is less at risk. COVID-19 is a notorious disease and anything can happen. And mucormycosis or black fungus is a devastating complication of it. We should always respect any new clinical fissures of our patient and take appropriate measure accordingly because every patient counts 100% to him or her. 
so happy new year again to everybody thank you very much for your patient sharing thank you dr john kumar singha for your excellent presentation i would like to request from panelists and participants is there if there is any question to ask to the speaker so we can uh, proceed to the next session uh, next case that will be present by presented by dr shantosh kumar shaha assistant professor from nicbd i would like to request dr shantosh kumar shaha for your presentation honorable chairperson respected audience and dear panelist welcome to to my presentation today i am going to present a case uh, of mitral stenosis associated with uh, multiple lesions dear audience you can uh, you know that uh, in case of uh, mitral stenosis if we go for short axis uh, at the level of mitral valve in webly we can see that the morphology of the mitral valve like a fish mouth deformity but this is not always true in case of children so today uh, my topic of presentation is that fishes are caught not always by their mouth uh, let us concentrate our case this is a 4 years old boy presented with frequent respiratory infection since infancy and at that time he needs four times admission for lower respiratory infections and during infancy he was diagnosed as a case of ventricular septal defect and after that after two years of age uh, these symptoms are gradually decreased now uh, he has only the exertional dyspnea so when we examine we found that uh, uh, he have a mid diastolic murmur at the apex and pan systolic murmur at the left lower external border and ejection systolic murmur at the left upper external border so from the from this history we can uh, easily understand that this is a case of vsd now let us see the echocardiographic clip uh, uh this is the apical four chamber view you can show that uh, the this is the la and lv is dilated and the morphology of the both uh, tricuspid and atrial valve looking normal there is prominent papillary muscle and the uh, uh, cardia are uh, uh, cardia looking disorganized and the uh, annulus is uh, more or less uh, mitral and tricuspid annulus 18 mm more or less same and color interrogation shows there is a pa4 shunting uh, left to right and also color interrogation through the mitral valve we can see the mitral inflow jet is exaggerated and the inflow gradient uh, is uh, main gradient is 18 mm mercury uh, 12 mm mercury suggestive of severe mitral stenosis but if we look for this uh, video clip the, there is morphology of the valve is normal and valve is uh, open nicely so why this is flow exaggeration why this mean gradient is 12 mm mercury let us see the so we have to concentrate to looking the sub valvular apparatus now colorful interrogation in the uh, uh, apical five chamber view we can show there is a vsd shunting left to right and you also see there is a spare of tissue from the ventricular uh, crest there is a projecting into the lbot producing the lbot obstruction and that's uh, and, and that gradient was 30 mm mercury so vsd with mild lbot obstruction causing by subaortic membrane and this is the vsd about 7 mm and there is a parasternal long axis view you can see there is a, a single papillary muscle you have to see and there is valve opening is good and you can see there is a subaortic membrane and also a vsd and color interrogation showing the uh, vsd gradient is 41 mm mercury and this is the short axis view at the level of aortic valve you can see the uh, location of vsd is approximately 9 9 o'clock position so this is obviously premium minus vsd and if we look for morphology of the valve this is the uh, parasternal short axis view at the level of mitral valve you can see 
the material bulb area is 1.3 uh, centimeter square. This is absolutely normal for this age and body surface area. And you also see there is a commissures are not fused. Uh, commercial fusion is not occur here and, and the morphology is nice. And this is the short axis view at the level of uh, uh, papillary muscle. You can see there is a single papillary muscle. So now the, we, can, uh, we can say that this is the, this, uh, this uh, MS is congenital MS due to parachute metal valve. And this is the subcoastal uh, sagittal view. You can show that is a PFO. And from this view, if we move the transistor clockwise, then you can see that you can open the RBOT. You can say there is a RBOT muscle band producing the obstruction at the level of infundibulum, causing uh, the infundibular stenosis also. So our diagnosis was, this is a case of situs solitus levocardia, normal systemic and pulmonary venous genus, atrioventricular and ventricular arterial concordance, a small PFO shunting left to right, mild to moderate MS due to parachute metal valve, and a moderate side premium venous with outlet extension VHD shunting left to right, mild LBOTO due to subaortic membrane, and mild RBOTO due to hypertrophied muscle bundle. So uh, we plan uh, for management of this patient as a VHD closer with resection of the subaortic membrane and resection of the RBOT muscle bundle and plus minus mitral valve repair. I think the mitral valve repair is not required at this stage. And we have to follow up this patient, uh, follow up this patient if the patient later presented to severe mitral stenosis. At that time, the patient may need mitral valve repair like the fenestration in the cordy or splitting of the papillary muscle. So take home message is MS in children is usually congenital. An MS not always present with annular adhesion with fish mouth deformity, as like fishes are caught not always by their mouth. Left to action exacerbate the mitral inflow gradient, so you can cannot classify as a, whether it is severe or moderate mitral stenosis. Associated lesion should be searched meticulously, and presence of BSD always should be looked for subaortic membrane or arbitrary muscle band. Thank you very much for present here. Thank you, sir, for your nice presentation. I'd uh, like to request from the panelists and the audience to have any question to the, our presenter. If no question from the audience, now I would like, like to request the, our panelists from the virtual platform to comment on the session. Anyone from the virtual platform. Please unmute yourself and comment on the session. Can I comment? I'm Professor Tinhin, can I comment? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I enjoyed all the cases and uh, especially the cases of Ch Dr. Choi Singha, it was a nice case, an excellent case immunocompromised case and black fungus. So total case was very interesting. And the last case, the Shantosh uh, Kumar Shaha, the congenital MS, even in adult cases, the congenital MS may present. In the adult heart disease, may I, I saw a patient, a female patient, female doctor, 21 years. She was diagnosed as a case of rheumatic MS, but finally I found that that was parasite mitral valve and there was supramitral membrane. So please do not hurry during echo look carefully at the warm morphology. And uh, so the whole treatment plan was changed and she was referred to WCT and finally uh, she, uh, get, uh, oper she got operation and, uh, and uh, now she is okay. And I want to uh, ask you know, Dr. Shantosh Kumar Shanha, uh, Sinha that you look carefully, I think there was also supraval membrane. When it was uh, uh, showing the four chamber view, the, I think something was moving near the annulus and turbulence was from there. So it is common that parasite mitral valve and the supramitral, supraval mitral membrane both present in the same cases. So please do carefully and look all aspects, starting from the color turbulence, when it starts, where it starts. So echo is not that we will do hurry look very carefully and meticulously so you will not miss the cases and valve morphology the leaflet thickening is not not only causing ms 
So keep in mind that there may be, when the, the leaflet is normal, but gradient is high. So please look, even in adult look, whether there is parasitic mitral valve, whether there is supravalve membrane, please look carefully. And all the presenters presented their case very nicely and congratulations to all. Thank you. Thank you, madam, uh, for your nice comment. But in this case, uh, usually parachute mitral valve also uh, association is very common associated with shown complex, multiple level of obstruction in the left side of the heart. Uh, heart. That is the shown complexes consist of the parachute, parachute mitral valve, supramatal membrane, yes. subaortic astronosis, and also coaptation of aorta. There are four components. But in this case, uh, I think not, uh, there is no supramatal ring as the Annulus is normal as, as like as like as with Thank you, madam. Thank you. Now I'm glad to request from our chairpersons to comment on the session and and conclude the session. I have seen the excellent cases and uh, <laughs> I'm very much glad to tell that uh, the uh, 50, more than 50% were well female. So I'm very much delighted to see all of them you know, presenting so very nice cases and excellent, excellent cases. And I uh, see the, um, like um, uh, Nehruma, so uh, uh, unroof coronary, uh, ASD's uh, unroof co coronary sinus, and then uh, Shahana like uh, Ortnas uh, with uh, uh, very, very rare complication. So, and uh, John's case was very nice, um, uh, um, very much, you know, um, rare mycomycosis. I haven't seen in my life, so uh, it was very also rare. And Nilufar, yes, uh, her, uh, uh, that uh, she has uh, seen uh, the, I think the Takashi uh, arteritis, uh, yes. It was also very uncommon. And uh, it was very, uh, we, have, we have also, um, given marks, all of us, <laughs> so all of us are um, given and we have uh, averaged it, but uh, all of uh, three of us uh, decided the same thing, <laughs> same results. So uh, thank you, thank you all very much and congratulations to all of you, thank you. And I think uh, we, we should go for the next session. And, and result, did you Result, did you Thank you, uh, thank you, organizer, sir. Amira Jal Bolu na apni bolu, sir. Thank you, organizer, giving me the, giving us the opportunity to judge. Actually, actually, all our uh, presenters are very excellent, and they all, they all are known to us. So very good competition, I need, I think. So may I uh, give the results first? In the third position, as the organizer said, there is three prizes. So third position, Dr. Chayan Kumar Sinha. <laughs> and uh, second runner-up, second runner-up, Dr. Shahana Jaman. And first, Naruma, Naruma <laughs> Albi Chowdhury. Thank you all. I'm going to Thank you. Very difficult to judge who is first, who is third, who is sixth. But uh, everyone has uh, performed very nicely and we are happy, we have enjoyed. Uh, congratulations to all uh, who has uh, got the prizes and who has not uh, got the prizes. No discrimination, we have enjoyed and they have presented very nicely. Again, congratulations to all. Thank you very much.